uh, David said, we are bioinformaticians, so we, we do mostly data analysis in for uh, omics data, so all data that comes from sequencers, so genomics, transcriptomics. And we are particularly specialized on cancer data sets. So we live in a hospital and we talk with clinicians all the time. But in the recent years, we started participating in some European projects where we bring like the oncologist perspective. And we try to bridge the gap, as I will show you later, between the, the community that will use some uh, tools that are, that are built by these big European projects and the community that builds the tools. This brought me to Barcelona, where we had wonderful time talking with many people. But what we will be discussing today is basically give you a temporal perspective of our journey through these projects, which are very nice, but sometimes very complicated. So there's a lot of stuff. Uh, maybe I will skip some, but I will try to give the opportunity to everybody to talk. So it all started in, oh, how does it go? Here, okay. It all started in 2018 when a lot of uh, European countries came together and say, look, we really want to share our genomic data to build a better healthcare and uh, 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 opportunity for research on clinicians to cure their patients well. It started with a clinical uh, end, end, end point that is not only cancers, but also rare disease, infectious disease was, was added during COVID. And the idea was to have this dream to create this infrastructure where genomes could be shared across different uh, research groups uh, and clinicians. Orig the original point was to do collect 1 million genomes by 2022. This, of course, hasn't happened. <laughs> but uh, uh, one of the reasons that it hasn't happened is that uh, the initiative was not funded. So they realized, OK, the, all the different uh, member states have taken a commitment, but they didn't have money to realize this commitment. So certain point about 2020, there was a funded uh, Horizon 20, I think it was Horizon 2020 Europe, uh, 20 uh, project that was uh, meant to uh, design and test this infrastructure, this time providing some money. And uh, so there were created many uh, work packages, some of them related to the ethical legal problems of sharing personal data some others about creating the, the infrastructure and some other creating use cases. And in particular, our group with our director, Giovanni Tonon, was in charge, still in charge of leading the use case based on cancer and oncology. So we were talking with David before. So what is a use case? There can be many things. It can be data sets, can be scenarios, and most of all, use cases have different purposes. So when you have a use case in mind, you should always ask, what is this for? And because the first interaction we had about use cases dates back in 2020, where people starting chatting with different uh, uh, oncology experts and starting some meetings. And when uh, the people working on ethical legal problem heard that they were discussing with oncologists, they came up to, to us and they started asking, okay, we are trying to envision how to uh, create an infrastructure. Can you just tell us a little bit of what, how the infrastructure will be, infrastructure that doesn't exist, will be used by clinicians and researchers and say, okay, we will talk with our clinicians and come up with some use cases, which in this case are just scenarios. They don't have any data. They just are uh, requests from the community. So some use cases were based uh, like on real healthcare problems. And sometimes we have like patients with some tumors that have some mutations. These mutations are weird. So they don't fall into the categories and they should be treated in some non-standard way. So they want to find similar cases in the community to see how the other uh, clinicians have dealt with these cases. And uh, some other use cases were more based on research. So they really wanted to take the data set and look for something in the data set that have been not been looked by the original analysis, which are two different words. So the first thing we realized is that sometimes healthcare uh, professionals have very practical questions that require easy and quick answers, like find me similar cases to mine, whereas researchers want to reanalyze their data the data, restart everything from scratch and try to 
uh, understanding things about the cases that have already been solved or other things. So first thing we realized, actually, research and healthcare have different needs. Then things were progressing and uh, uh, the infrastructure started to be built. And in particular, there were people in charge for the infrastructure that created the prototype. This is already quite old, you know, talking about 2021, 2022, uh, for the use case of rare diseases. Rare diseases is a logical starting point because it's uh, a very simple use case. Sometimes you're born with a single mutation that is in all your cells in your body and that gives you a problem. But from the point of view of the complexity of the data set is very low because you just have one point to look at to query at this point. And so we said, okay, uh, that's very nice. Let's see if we can use it for cancer too. And uh, so we started with this kind of uh, uh, old uh, infrastructure, and which was divided in three parts. One part was the data search. So I want to search for data set, genomic data sets, and also clinical data sets that have the characteristics I want. For example, I want a patient with a mutation in this, in this point, genomic, that has taken this drug, clinical. Find other... Uh, cases with this kind of characteristics. Then there was a, a very a part, more technical part about storage and access. So where the data is, do I have the rights to see these data sets? And then there is a part and say, once I have got access to the data, what do I do with them? So uh, this was a little bit uh, uh, my, my job. <laughs> and so they say, okay, this, the question here is, are patients with similar mutation of phenotypes? Can I access the data? And can I do something on them? And what we came up is that some infrastructural parts were pretty much universal, so it can be translated from the rare disease to cancer. Some things were not as, uh, uh, can, cannot be translated because like typically the data concerning a cancer patient is more complex. Typically, you're not born with a cancer, but you get cancer during your life and this cancer transforms according to the drugs you take so, or to the surgery you have. So there is a longitudinal component which is not present in area diseases. And then we also found that what you do with your data afterwards is pretty much discipline specific. So there is here there is a uh, an application, it's called GPUP, which is vertical on rare disease, and it's not useful for the needs of uh, oncologist. So we realized there was something to be improved uh, for our platform, this platform to become really useful. Some things were actually uh, solved automatically by the technology. We use, for example, a tool for querying uh, genomes, which is called Beacon, which by the time uh, we finished this analysis, went to a version two, which accommodated most of the things that were not uh, uh, present in version one that uh, were not ideal for cancer. Some other things are related to the fact that the genetic data on a cancer case is more complex. You don't have only mutation in single points of the DNA, but also big piece of DNA that move around where they shouldn't. And the complexity of the clinical data is higher with the longitudinal axis I told you. And we need some uh, particular, uh, let's say, tool to analyze, uh, reanalyze cancer data. So we started reasoning on action points. So the first one was the fact that uh, the clinical data were usually not interoperable. And then we started uh, building some synthetic use case with the use with the collaboration of many other groups, including David, uh, to test this infrastructure for the cancer data. And I will briefly talk about inter interoperability of clinical data because it's actually an extremely uh, timely point. Like funny enough, uh, genomic data are produced by machines. So they are pretty much standardized when they came out. Clinical data are usually written by doctors who are human, and they write whatever they want. So it's much harder to reconcile what two different doctors in two different hospitals, perhaps in two different countries, have written about the patient rather than comparing two genomes produced in the same places. And uh, so we started tackling this problem. And we say, okay, for cancer, we should come up with a minimal data set, clinical. Minimal is very important because everybody wants to add what they're really interested about. And they say, okay, 
let's define a core of things that all the data sets should have. Then you can add whatever you want. They should, they should uh, of course, both for, for clinical and research, and we should have this uh, longitudinal axis that we, we talked about before. And it should be based on uh, already used standards in the field. So we went to our community of oncologists. We chatted a bit. We decided uh, what are the main data dictionaries used through a surveys. Like, uh, say, okay, what are you using? They're, no, don't bother you with the details of this, but let's say we we surveyed what the what the community was using, and we try to unify uh, the different standards into a minimal data set that had 140 items. Not all of them are compulsory, of course. Just the bunch is uh, is mandatory. Divided in domains, and most of all, we we try to minimize as much as possible the use of free text because that creates a lot of uh, problems lost in translations. And we try to use also vocab control vocabularies uh, related to data standards. So this was a big piece of work that uh, created a lot of feedback uh, from uh, the oncologists. Uh, so we said, OK, this is what we, what we have done. Do you actually agree with that? Yes, no. We divided the different uh, fields uh, or in domains. And they are divided in mandatory, recommended, and optional. And you can always add new stuff if you need. This was actually very well received because we managed to publish it on Natural Genetics uh, a few months ago, so in 2024, mm -hmm. which kind of was kind of surprising for us because it really felt that this is a need. So the fact that clinical data are not interoperable is a big problem for every country. And in fact, we started working with other hospitals around the Europe, where we bas they basically say, yes, we are doing the same things, but we the little difference about uh, how you treat your patient, how you annotate your data, how you, you create a database with your patients can really hinder the uh, interoperability of data from one hospital to the other. So it's very common that if you go to a hospital and you get some tests, then you go to another hospital after six months, and the other hospital cannot read the data the first hospital has produced. So they redo the test, which is, of course, it's, I mean, I see people laughing, but it's, it's really true and it's really a problem because it's a, a lot loss of data, of, of data, a loss of money. Sometimes some, some of these exams are not really nice on the patients, like uh, CT scans or x rays. So you should minimize rather than doing it every time. And it creates a lot of confusion on the patient itself because sometimes you get to different, uh, slightly different diagnosis, or perhaps a mutation is called in a pipeline within an hospital, but not by an, like another pipeline in another hospital because the filter is different. And the patient ask, comes to you and says, Do I have this mutation or not? And two different uh, uh, reports say different things. So we start there also in, in, uh, uh, in let's say, an initiative across Europe to try to reconcile all these things, uh, where basically we try to agree on a way to exchange data. It's called DG1, which is a federation of uh, uh, hospitals we, have, we are part of. Big, big problem. We are, start, we are still taking baby steps, but at least uh, we are realized we have a problem. And uh, then we published this paper in 2024, but it was a job that started like a year and a half before. So we're now to going back a little bit where we talk about the synthetic oncological use case inspired by uh, the uh, rare disease proofs of concept that I showed you before. I leave the floor to Georgia and we'll describe this part. Thank you. Okay, yes, uh, as Michael was saying, we start doing some use cases uh, for just um, test the infrastructure that uh, Beyond One Minion Genome and the European project started to implement. And so uh, just to give you an idea, we started generating cancer use cases with synthetic data, which means both genomic data were synthetic and also clinical data, because every time we would like to have a use case, so a patient with an history, that we generate in different way. And every time I have the associated clinical data of the patients and the genomic data, as it was a, a patient that go to the hospital and perform some NGS test and have the results. 
so uh, we started in 2023 and uh, for one case uh, we have uh, genomic data from cell lines for example or other that were more advanced and give us the starting point to more advanced also uh, use cases was uh, uh, together with the group of David to have uh, synthetic genomes by using uh, more improved uh, bioinformatic pipelines to uh, spike in mutation that we are interested in and also regarding clinical data were synthetic and were um, generated according to the minimal data set for cancer that Marco, Marco showed just before. And the only limitation is that the, these cases that were three, and then I will show you these three cases were single patient. And uh, so we will see later in the fourth step that we did uh, an improvement of this. But just to give you an idea, we started with these three cases, one of melanoma, no small cell lung cancer, and CML, so uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. And for every, every case, we got uh, clinical data that can be inspired by literature or by, I don't know, uh, for example, um, the fact that we uh, work in an hospital to have collaboration with uh, uh, clinicians in molecular tumor board, for example, or look into database and case reports. And then as genomics data, we can have synthetic genomes by using BAM surgeon, we will see later, and, uh, um, or by using data that are already available, as it was the case of the melanoma one. And then uh, just focus on some somatic alteration that are interesting for the, the cancer uh, history of the patient. So I would like just to give you an idea of how one of these, the one of no small cell lung cancer was, was generated. And this was uh, inspired by a paper that was published in a, as a case report. And uh, this was interesting because uh, we start with a particular mutation then uh, it is um, a diagnostic marker for no small cell lung cancer. That was this ROST1 rearrangement. Sorry, i show you this, it's probably is better. Uh, a ROST1 uh, rearrangement that is uh, known and as a diagnostic marker for no small cell lung cancer. And this uh, makes starting a particular therapy uh, using uh, kerizotinib, but after some time, what happens normally in cancer we got a resistance uh, something doesn't work very well and so uh, another therapy or in this case was a, um, a therapeutic regimen was applied to get an improved uh, an improved uh, response to the treatment but also in this case it doesn't uh, happen and then we got uh, in the paper, they got the NGS testing and tried to find if there was some genetic uh, causes that uh, gives this kind of resistance to these uh, two therapies. And indeed, the fact was that a BRAF B600E mutation appears and the ROS1 arrangement completely disappears. So this is a kind of case that we would, would like just to uh, have as a standard in the use case. So a history of the patient, the clinical data that are related to the kind of test, the stage of the tumor, the kind of diagnostic markers that we have, and uh, the therapy and the treatment, and also in a temporal line. So we have also longitudinal uh, clinical information. And then uh, this exactly have an idea of the, of the case and extract what are the interesting clinical features that we would like to have in our synthetic clinical data. And everything was then mapped inside the one million uh, genome minimal data set for cancer. So we try to find information that are from the patient uh, that can, we can retrieve from the case and uh, other related to the treatment, the therapy and NGS testing and the results of the, and the genetic alteration that we are focused. And instead, another point is that since we are inside a, a consortium where different tools are provided and we need to use them, we then uh, apply, a map again, the 1 million mm, genome minimal data set for cancer to Phenopakis, which is another standard for clinical data. And we kind of maps uh, categories, for example, on the left side, you see the 1 million uh, genome minimal data set for cancer and on the right side the phenopockets and we try to find some mapping between the features that we have on one side and the other and this is not so easy and this is another point of interoperability that we are kind of managing in this sense 
sometimes we have some univoc mapping but some other times it is not so univoc so you have just to find which is the correct place uh, in which uh, features must be put uh, in order to have a correct query in the end when you have to query the database and extract mm -hmm. information and so just yes Mm, as you can see, uh, some of them are really univoc as this is, and I mean, this is really important to have this is univocally, the treatment is univoc, and also uh, biomarkers, for example, in this case, is more specific in phenopakets in the biosamples uh, category, which is really uh, strongly characterized. And then uh, regarding instead the synthetic data, we generate the synthetic data together with David by, uh, first of all, uh, have an idea of uh, other uh, mutations that can be added together with the one that we are interested in, that was the uh, BRAF mutation. We extract them from Acacia in uh, ECGC. We extract the somatic mutation that we are interested in. And uh, they apply, uh, Rodrigo, uh, in this case, a uh, bump surgeon to spike in the mutation that we are interested into uh, the normal germinal DNA from the GIAB uh, data set, from which we have two bumps, bump files. So it's like uh, I go to the hospital, I got sequenced my blood and my biopsies. And so I have this data and then everything was applied, the uh, asomatic variant calling to extract the uh, ABCL file. That was exactly what we expect to have since we put the, the mutation that we are interested in. So in this sense, we got from our side the clinical data in phenol packets and all of the genomics data in different formats just to test our infrastructure. So yes, from my side, it's all. So I will yeah. leave again the floor. Okay. No, I think what is important to realize that is that the first wave of scenarios were designed to reason about the sharing of personal uh, sensitive data which fall under GDPR, which cannot be fully anonymized because you have to think of a genome like as a face picture. Mm -hmm. So you cannot really uh, anonymize it without losing some details. And that, so they had this first pur purpose. The second purpose was to test a given infrastructure that was designed for another use case. So we create a single patient with genetic and clinical data. But then at a certain point, we came here actually to Barcelona in January talking with Salva, and we realized that probably this is not, uh, we can do better than that. So we can say, okay, uh, what actually our user want to do with this platform, it doesn't exist anymore. So rather than testing the platform and thinking about upsell scenarios, we would like to go back to our users and see whether they can, how they can use this, this platform in the future. In the meantime, uh, Beyond One Million Genome finished, and then another pro European project called GDI, Genomic Data Infrastructure, started. And GDI was a much more applicative pro pro project with respect to the first one. So it's not anymore the design and testing, but it's really creating an infrastructure. What happens is that GDI is, create, is made by few pillars, right? And just to give you an idea, there is one pillar that is in charge with the infrastructure, which is pillar two, and one pillar which is charged with use cases, which is pillar three. And the infrastructure uh, evolved. So the early picture that I showed you before is transformed in a, in a series of functionalities that are regarding discovery, that access management, storage and interfaces, or reception and processing. So it's the revised version of what you saw before, which uh, are, and in the, to realize these functionalities, there are products that are de dedicated to one of these functionalities, and they are all collected in a starter kit that should be deployed on each node on this European infrastructure. Now it's work in progress. It started in last year, and they are now the first uh, tier of nations are starting to, to, de to deploy it, but it's still, uh, uh, not given. What I would like to, to draw your attention, though, is that if you look at this nice cartoon, so you have pillar two on one side, infrastructure, use cases on the other side, a lot of arrows going back and forth means that the two things should talk to each other and should interact and really change. Whereas we realize that this that doesn't, doesn't really happen much. So that's why we are trying to go to our community with some use cases and then knock at the door of the people who are making the infrastructure and say, Look, is the infrastructure you're you're building on your own 
satisfying what we need to do with it. So that's how we starting new action points that are first to create some use cases that reflect the user's needs. It's a big, a lot of work with a lot of people in our group. And also start testing some of the tools that are providing this infrastructure to see if they are use, usable enough. So whoop, with this, uh, you start. <laughs> So now we will see uh, the new wave of use cases that we built. Um, these are all the people from our institution that uh, uh, make it possible. And so, first of all, why we need a new use case? As uh, we already said, the first wave of use case were based on a single patient. So it actually uh, allowed for a limited uh, queries possible because uh, you cannot uh, simulate that it's in a, in a in a different country, so let's say in different nodes. And in fact, they were built primarily to test the infrastructure. And what we want to do uh, is to create a small cohort of patients, in this case, uh, uh, so a use case for cancer. So again, there will be patients with cancer, but with different aspects. And to um, make it more realistic, so uh, we ask uh, our clinicians and so oncologists what they would like to search in the infrastructure. What, what what are they need? And among all the, uh, the things that came up during uh, our surveys, we select uh, as a starting point, uh, the cancer as a rare disease concept. That is a, a quite new uh, definition actually. That means that if you uh, deeply characterize a, a cancer, both from the clinical point of view, but also from the molecular, you can have uh, you can consider the cancer as unique. So, so the patient will be uh, uh, with a, a rare disease sort of, and of course this will impact on, also on the therapy that uh, you will uh, you will get. So starting from uh, this point, uh, as we repeated a lot of time, we are trying to uh, be the intermediate between the final users of the platform that will be the clinicians or the researchers and also the platform developers. And uh, to, to try to solve this uh, issue, we uh, use the use case as an exercise, let's say. And we uh, define uh, actually three different levels that are the infrastructure problems, let's say, the molecular problems and the clinical problems. So um, this is uh, how we with the use case. Also, Georgia already explained for the first uh, for the first use case, it's quite similar. Uh, let's say that the, the case description can start uh, from a real patient that, that uh, we see in the hospital or can be uh, simulated based on like epidemiological and molecular and clinical model. Then we, we are deep involved with the clinicians and the experts in the field because they need to validate our simulated patient to make it, uh, to ensure scientific coherence. And from this uh, case description, the two branches uh, come up uh, that are the data model and the synthetic data. So in the data model, actually, as uh, uh, we see, uh, we collect the clinical information we want to keep uh, in the, for the patient, for the simulated patients, and we use the 1 million genome minimal data set for cancer. And then we map back to uh, phenopackets, that is another uh, standard for clinical data. In the synthetic data, what we did uh, along with uh, the David uh, Torret group uh, is to, first of all, identify the driver genes, uh, so the biomarker, let's say, of the, the cancer. And then we also collect uh, some background uh, somatic mutation from uh, CBAR portal, literature, and so on. And because in this case, we want to uh, make it more uh, realistic uh, and also to increase a little bit uh, the complexity of uh, of the case, and then we actually produce the, the sequence, the, the simulated sequence with them. And uh, how it started, uh, actually, the first use case uh, was uh, arise during uh, the Cancer Center and Molecular Tumor Board in our hospital. So there was this patient with pancreatic adenocarcinoma that is a type of pancreatic cancer, but quite uh, rare. And uh, this patient presented with a complex histological pattern and also an uncommon uh, BRAF mutation. 
So the clinicians uh, during this molecular tumor board uh, wanted to know if they could treat uh, this patient uh, as uh, if it had uh, a classical BRAF mutation. So it, it seems uh, a use case uh, itself because it's uh, uh, something that the clinician would like to search for in the infrastructure. So are there any other patients uh, were, uh, in Europe that uh, have a similar uh, mutation and have been treated? So from... Uh, uh, so this is actually is the, the case presentation, so the real patient. And the, we highlight in yellow all the, um, the clinical and epidemiological terms that uh, we want to keep in our uh, simulated patient. Uh, and we map uh, it uh, in the Fino packets. Uh, that is a JSON file, actually. And then this is uh, our final cohort uh, that is uh, uh, made of three patients. So the first patient uh, is the one that I just uh, described, that is this uh, with pancreatic carcinoma, uh, uh, cell carcinoma, in which we keep uh, the original phase, so all the mutation and also uh, the clinical uh, data. But, and we only add some somatic background mutation. Then from this first uh, patient, uh, we derive other two um, variations. So uh, we built uh, uh, another, uh, another patient with uh, pan um, pancreatic duct uh, adenocarcinoma. And in this case, we try to make it uh, more challenging by um, adding a complex genetic alteration. And in the third case, uh, again with a PDAC, we uh, instead try to modify, to make it more challenging, the clinical part. So we uh, add some comorbidities. So now the final uh, uh, question that we can ask is, uh, what we can do with this final use case that uh, we built? Actually, we try to answer to some of the issues that uh, are schematically reported in this slide. So first of all, we can then exploit the data federation, because as I was saying, uh, this is a, a small cohort, uh, but uh, it's better than the, the only uh, the single patient we had before. And now we can actually simulate uh, the presence of a patient in different uh, hospital around Europe uh, and uh, to uh, try to access this data in a, in a federated uh, uh, manner. The other point we can address with this use case is to perform some data queries that our clinician told us to be the most relevant for them. So uh, one of it is the gene-centered, because you can think that the clinician uh, will go to the platform to search for other patients mutated in the same gene as is on patient. So for this, uh, to answer to this uh, question, we introduce uh, BRAF mutation in all uh, our three patients, uh, but with different variations. So we keep in the first patient, uh, the, the one that uh, it really had the, in the real patient. So this uh, um, in-frame insertion, we put uh, a gene fusion that uh, involve a BRAF in the second patient, uh, and we keep a very common um, hotspot, uh, that is the BRAF V600E, uh, that is uh, common in other type of cancer more than in the, in the PDAC setting. And, and this is a one type of data queries that we can perform. The other uh, very important is uh, about the treatment and clinical management of the patient. So to answer to this question, uh, actually we imagine that uh, a, a clinician for the first two cases uh, will uh, ask to the platform, are there any other uh, patient uh, with this uh, uncommon mutation that uh, have been treated with the BRAF MEC inhibitors, for example, and how was the how was going the therapy, and how is uh, the progress, let's say. And in the third and last case, actually, we introduced, uh, as I was saying, some uh, comorbidities that in this case are chronic kidney disease and ear impairment. And for this reason, uh, these two comorbidities impact on the first line chemotherapy of the patient. And so we imagine that in this case, uh, the oncologist may want to search in the platform for other therapeutic alternative due to this kind of comorbidities. And uh, with this, uh, actually, uh, we can move on and with Francesca, that is the last speaker for today. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, so we now go back to the action point, the step two, that uh, concerned the testing of uh, some tools. And here we have another team working on, on it, which I'm part of. 
And so I would like to show you the tools that we decided to test and what we have done up to date and what we are planning to do to better achieve our uh, main aim. So I would like to introduce you to Beacon, which is uh, the, the tool the, that we decided to test. And the Beacon is a tool that is developed uh, from the Global Alliance uh, for Genomic Health in collaboration with Elixir, uh, that is the European Bioinformatic Infrastructure. And uh, Beacon actually allows for the discovery of genomic, but not also genomic, also phenoclinic uh, data across uh, different data set uh, and is based on a query system. So the main aim of Beacon is the data sharing and the collaboration, of course, in the genomics research by enabling researchers coming from different institutions to query the data set, to query the, the database and the system. So how does Beacon actually work? Beacon uh, basically relies on these two systems, a query system and a response system. This means that the end users can query uh, beacons, so the database, uh, for example, with a specific uh, variance that he is interested in. And uh, uh, as a response, he will get back uh, uh, like a yes or no based on the presence of that specific variant in the databases that he decided to, to query. So of course, it's very important uh, that uh, um, there, there is a standardization of the protocol to ensure the consistency across uh, all the databases and all the institutions that uh, build up their own beacon. <clears throat> so you have to imagine that, uh, for example, we have like uh, in, uh, in this graphical representation, we have different kind of organization that can be uh, research institution, hospitals, of course, and private entities. And so we have the final users that decide to query the beacons that all these different kind of organization have built up for a specific uh, genomic variation that he's interested. And he got back all the response from all these institutions that decide to build up the beacon and to make their mm, genomic data available for the queries. Okay, so uh, actually what I want to point out is that the latest release of Beacon um, has introduced some powerful, new powerful features. And this means, uh, for example, that the query can be more complex. So you can ask not only for the presence of a single variant, but for example, you can ask for uh, which are the variants in a specific region of the genome that I'm interested in. So uh, it's not just a single variant, but Mm, we are moving to more complex queries. And uh, you can also retrieve more information, uh, especially about uh, samples. So for example, concerning the phenotypes or uh, the biomedical parameters. And as a, as a response, uh, of course, uh, mm, you, you will not receive only a yes or no, but for example, if you are querying for which are the variants in a specific genomic regions, you can have back as a response, for example, a BCF file that you can download with all the variants within that region that you are interested in. So now you can easily understand that within this context, mm, there are different types of Beacon users because of course we have the end users, that is the one who's going to query the Beacon, the one who wants to know uh, if the variants that he's interested in is present in some other Beacons. But then, of course, we also have the deployers that are the people that decide to make their data available through the beacon. So they have to build up the beacon and make the data within the beacon shareable and uh, available for the other who wants to make the queries. And then finally, we have the implementers that uh, actually are those who provide their expertise, their technical expertise uh, to develop the beacon itself, so to make it work and uh, to do some improvements in the in the usage and in the work of Beacon. And uh, this, uh, uh, I'm telling you this because uh, I want to point out that here as a center, we're working as a, a deployers. This means that uh, our main aim was to try to set up a Beacon, to put our data within the Beacon and try to make it work for making uh, and testing some queries on the data that we put within the Beacon. And uh, why we're doing this? Because uh, uh, first of all, we would like to, of course, apply the beacon tool to the uh, synthetic data in the context of cancer that uh, were developed by 
Elisa and Georgia and, uh, and so on, but uh, we started from the easiest scenario that is represented, of course, uh, uh, by the rare disease. Because as I was telling you, it's easier to investigate to a single mutation than to consider more complex scenario that could be represented by cancer, where we have, for example, more complex alteration, longitudinal studies, uh, which involve different treatments uh, or uh, metastasis progression and so on. So we started from the, in, from the simpler scenario, let's say. Okay, to do that, uh, we follow the uh, beacon reference implementation documentation. Uh, and this is a, a toolkit, like a starter kit, that give you all the things that you need to set up a beacon and to load your data within a beacon. So uh, it gives you tools for extraction, transformation, and loading of data. It gives you also an example data set. And uh, of course, the, the database, that is an instance that you use to put your data on it. And the uh, beacon to query engine, that is uh, the thing that you use to make queries, OK? So our workflow can be summarized by four different steps. So of course, uh, uh, at the very beginning, we have the data retrieval because we didn't use the example data set, but we want to focus on synthetic data from a rare disease uh, scenario. And then of course, we move to Docker installation and data beaconization, which are very well explained in the, in the toolkit that uh, I showed you before. And of course, at the end, we try to make a query to see if everything works fine. So starting from data retrieval, uh, we uh, retrieved our, da our data from the um, EGA archive. Uh, so we decided to uh, consider this uh, synthetic data coming from uh, the study of rare disease. We have six different cases. And for each uh, of those cases, we have the mother, the father, and the, and the proband. And uh, so we decide to focus on this kind of data to put them into the, into the beacon that we are trying to set up. The following step, which means the Docker installation and the data beaconization were all performed following the toolkit, the B2RI toolkit. So this means that we were able to install the Docker, build up the beacon, and the data beaconization means that we have to transform our data coming from EGA to a beacon friendly format so that they can be used inside the beacon. And finally, of course, uh, uh, we make the queries and to test it, we started from a very, uh, let's say simple uh, case where we make a query for this gene, the RY, R1 gene variant, and we get back the response since we ask just, do you have this variant uh, G2A in position that you can see here, and we have as a response exist true. So the query uh, worked. So right now, uh, what we are going to do, of course, the work that need to be done is still a lot because we were able to build up a beacon and make it work. But uh, our aim is, of course, to include more samples in the case of the rare disease, so including more individuals and creating a, a court. But of course, this has to be done with the long-term goal to apply all these to our synthetic uh, data in the cancer context. So of course, we want to move to more complex queries and to a more complex scenario. So this was just a test that we need to do to then move forward so that in the end, what we are expecting to do uh, is to use Beacon of course, with complex alteration. So for example, the query won't be, do you have this variant, yes or no, but it will be something more complicated. Like for example, as you can see here, can you provide data about gene fusion in BRAP gene in pancreatic adenocarcinoma patients? So this will be the main goal. And uh, yes, with this, I have concluded, so. I think like, okay, uh, this is the end. <laughs> <laughs> so you can believe. <laughs> No, but thanks everybody for the attention. And I think I think we, we spoke about many different things, but it's it's really the, the nice part of living on the edge between different communities. And you see there are things that were more technical, other things that were more uh bi biology and clinics oriented. Uh, but really trying to uh 
understand a little bit of both worlds is what really motivates us and brings us here and uh, to this project. If you have any questions, we are happy to uh, answer. <laughs> Well, I have many questions, and uh, you don't like it. Uh, the first one is about the fusions, about the query, because uh, just yesterday I was in the Global Alliance Scout, if you know what Scouts, and they are talking how to implement it, because Gigan doesn't support it yet. I mean, you cannot uh, query complex uh, query. It's not, it's not going to work. Uh, I have a question about... Can I... Sorry? And can ah, you comment okay. on this just quickly? Oh, we, we just uh, good point. I mean, um, on one hand, uh, this is a need from the community because certain type of cancer, especially leukemias, all these things, they really rely on, on uh, chromosome rearrangements rather than plant mutations. So this is something we need to do. We participate in some J for J meeting, and we realize that even from the annotation of the structural variants. There's not like a complete, uh, uh, let's say, agreement like, because they are complex or so where they start, where they end, and like that. So indeed, this is a problem that roots before the beacon because the beacon just interprets what is annotated. My impression is that the community has realized this is a problem and they are providing solution. You probably more no more than me, David, but. Uh, in the end, so we will get there. Look, I think that for some kind of specific gene fusions, so sometimes clinicians are very, let's say, vague. Is this gene fused with this gene? I don't care where, but just if you if you have part of this gene that goes with this gene, for me, it's, it's good enough. So definitely is, a, is an interface where we need some work, but it could be helped by the fact that there are people trying to solve the problem, and sometimes the level of details we need is low. You know, it's so my point that uh, if you have real use cases, it will be quite useful. I mean, for this uh, scout group about variation mm -hmm. inquiries, because uh, what we actually need is, uh, uh, I think, to think uh, there are two points: is how to query, yeah, and uh, how to represent it in uh, yeah. in birds because it's actually be contrived to adopt. Yeah, we will use the first. Definitely, it would be really, really interesting to, for us. Okay, and the number. Sorry, if I use okay, this is a question about one short. Uh, one short. One short. It's uh, okay. then you generate the synthetic data for clinician data. You generate the textual data, or you generate just kind of packets uh, immediately. Oh, we have the case description, so as uh, we see in a so a text, mm -hmm. and but of course then we provide uh, the JSON, so a the final packets. Uh, okay, but what what is the first source of uh, synthetic data? Is a textual description of uh, in this case of patients, and then yeah, 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 right. yeah. Okay. Put another hand. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I understand this so well, but you say that you get the data from CMA portal. Yeah, but in CMA portal, all all the data is in a plain text <laughs> field. So how do you uh, standardize the, this data? So it's difficult yeah, because each uh, researcher could put yeah. um, different variables for the same uh, things there. So it's difficult to uh, standardize this. Okay. Actually, from C -Bio portal, we only retrieve uh, somatic uh, background variation, not uh, clinical data. So we. We use it uh, as a, a way to um, increase the complexity of our um, uh, sequence data because we want we didn't want to put just the, the biomarker but to have it uh, in a later context. So we search for similar cases uh, in C -Bio portal having the same genes mutated and maybe the same variation, and we download uh, the the file that is actually an Excel and. But this is an excellent mm -hmm. point. I mean, like, super portal is very much used, but clinical data are usually coherent only within the same cohorts and mm -hmm. by the same. Mm -hmm. If you go to another cohort, this is This is another, yet another interoperability on clinical yeah. problem on clinical data, mm -hmm. which could be solved by using, for example, the minimal cancer data set, but it would anyway require the mapping on what you already have. And at the moment, it's, uh, it's basically probably, in my opinion, one of the biggest limitations of super portal. 
this minimal cancer state set that model uh happens do you do you think we have to yes to do like a value or something like that in a mall or fire or something like that yes to standardize you other uh, that's the idea. Model. That's the idea. I mean, of course, uh, the idea would be that it would be integrated and also mapped to other other kind of data models. Um, that's what we like to do. Uh, sometimes there are also a little bit of a political level, where you know, like some country have developed their own data and want to keep this data model. So we are proposing it and try to highlight the compatibility with what you already have. Uh, so ideally, we, we want make as many people as possible to use it. We probably won't get to 100%, but the fact that now it's published and now it's popular, and if we can use it in these use cases by using the GDI, it would be like a big push. Yeah, since I have a question if I may because at some point you said you would use this minimal data set and then turn about it to contract with the outside. Yeah. Is this going to be a standard thing? Or it's, are you going to well, because you lose you lose it's a GDI it. thing. So okay. we probably have to because Phenopax is already within GDI, okay. so we need to adapt. I see. Because the world is going to be about translating. Yeah, to, no, absolutely. Everybody's moving from here to more, from the more to whatever. Yes. No, so, I mean the mapping and the translating would be crucial. Let's say within GDI, also with the other uh Use cases, yes. you know, packets is there, so we adapted. Yeah. This is currently done by hand, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. better just yeah, to have something that is more automatically in control. A lot of room for improvement. It's been five, six, seven years uh, discussing this. Okay. We are going to be ahead. Any other small question? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.